Welcome back, Highlanders, to part three of chapter two here in our Econ 2 class. Remember, at the end of part two, we finished up by talking about the four factors that shift the production possibilities curve. Those factors included a change in resources, a change in technology, a change in the rules or laws under which an economy functions, and then a change in work habits. So we're going to start off this third and final part of Chapter 2 with a uh, question for you uh, to see how well you already understand our next topic. So this question reads, uh, Bill Gates is considered one of the richest people in the world and is often classified as being worth over $100 billion. He also lists washing dishes as one of his favorite hobbies, uh, and that's actually true, and believes his careful attention to detail makes him one of the best dishwa dishwashers around. I don't know if you really believe that or not. I just kind of made that part up. But in fact, he can wash dishes better than any other one person should Bill Gates wash his own dishes, right? So do you think Bill Gates should wash his own dishes because he can do it better than any other one person is the question, right? Now, if you said yes, because he likes doing it and he can do it better than any other one person, right? Then that's not necessarily a wrong answer. But if you said no, because Bill Gates probably has better things to do with his time, then you already understand the next concept we're going to talk about which is the law of comparative advantage. So the law of comparative advantage says that the total output of a group of individuals, an entire economy, or a group of nations will be greatest when the output of each good is produced by whoever has the lowest opportunity cost. In other words, it's not necessarily who can do it the best, or who can do it the fastest, or who even likes it the most. It's who can do it the cheapest or at the lowest opportunity cost. So I told you that Bill Gates is worth over $100 billion. It's actually been estimated that Bill Gates' hourly wage in terms of uh, how much money he makes is about $1.38 million per hour. So if he gave up his $1.38 million to spend an hour cleaning dishes, then that might not be as efficient as if he hired somebody to say wash his dishes for him for maybe 20 bucks an hour. So in other words, he could work that hour, make his $1.38 million dollars, and then from that, pay somebody a lot less to wash dishes instead, and therefore he'll still have his clean dishes as well as some more money in the bank. So should Bill Gates wash his own dishes? Not according to the law of comparative advantage, because there's somebody else out there who if they can do it better or faster, they can certainly do it cheaper. Right. So that's kind of how the law of comparative advantage works in kind of a microeconomic perspective. But let's go ahead and talk about how this works in a macroeconomic uh, perspective. So the main idea here behind the law of comparative advantage is that if we're talking about, say, a group of nations or uh, states or any large group of trading partners, then they can actually maximize their production by specializing in what they can produce at the lowest opportunity cost and then trade for everything else. So let's go through an example here, right? Let's say that we have two states. And again, I'm going to try to see if I can use my different colors here. Let's say that we have two states here. Let's say that we got uh, California. And then our other state that we're going to be talking about is Washington. So it's not Washington, D.C., but Washington State up there in the Pacific Northwest. So we've got two states, California and Washington. And let's say that both states are good at producing wine. And let's say that both states are also good at producing microchips. Now let's say if you're the state of California, you can produce uh, 50 bottles of wine uh, or uh, you can produce 10 microchips, right? In the state of Washington, they can produce 20 bottles of wine or they can produce, say, five microchips in, we'll say, a given uh, hour or you could say even a given day, right? So with that in mind, right, now... When you look at California, they can produce both more wine and more microchips in the state of Washington, probably because they just have a lot more people. It's a much bigger state. So we would say that California has the absolute advantage in producing both wine and microchips and that they can produce more of both, right? But just uh, because you have the absolute advantage of both things doesn't mean you're going to have the comparative advantage of both things. In fact, it's impossible to have the comparative advantage of both things. You can only have the comparative advantage in one thing. And the reason why is because comparative advantage is who can do it relatively cheaper. So if you can do one thing relatively cheaper than somebody else, then that must mean that they can do the other thing relatively cheaper than you, right? So with that in mind, in order to figure out who has the comparative advantage, then we need to figure out the opportunity cost of these activities. 
So we'll do that opportunity cost here in red, right? So again, California can produce 50 bottles of wine or 10 microchips. So the idea is that every time they produce a bottle of wine, they're giving up one fifth of a microchip that they can no longer produce, right? We got that just by dividing that uh, um, 10 by 50. By the same token, for every microchip that California produces, right, that is five bottles of wine that it is not producing. So the opportunity cost of producing a microchip is five bottles of wine, right? And then we can do the same thing for the state of Washington. So when Washington produces 20 bottles of wine, they can't produce five microchips, which means that for every bottle of wine they produce, that's one-fourth of a microchip that they give up. And then for every microchip that they produce, right, that is four bottles of wine that they can no longer make. Right? So when it comes to producing wine, who's giving up the fewest microchips in order to produce a bottle of wine? Right? Well, California gives up one-fifth of a microchip for every bottle of wine, whereas Washington gives up one-fourth of a microchip. One-fifth is less than one-fourth, so even though California has the absolute advantage in producing wine, they also have the comparative advantage in producing wine because, again, they can give up fewer bottles of, or, sorry, fewer microchips for every bottle of wine that they produce. Now, when it comes to who has the comparative advantage in producing microchips, well, even though, again, California has the absolute advantage in producing microchips, Washington has the comparative advantage in producing those microchips and that they give up fewer bottles of wine. So the idea here is that because California has the comparative advantage in wine, then California should specialize in wine. In other words, they produce only wine while the state of Washington specializes in microchips. So in other words, they produce only microchips. So rather than California producing both microchips and wine, they specialize in wine. And rather than Washington producing both microchips and wine, they specialize in those microchips. Oops, sorry about that there. In wine. All right, and then California, after specializing in wine and producing wine, should trade wine to Washington in exchange for microchips. And uh, I don't really care that you uh, can identify this so much for this class, but if you're wondering, like, what should the exchange rate be? Well, if they traded one microchip for, say, uh, 4.5 bottles of wine, then both sides would be better off, right? Because, again, uh, Washington is getting 4.5 bottles of wine for every microchip, whereas before, if they wanted to uh, produce wine, it would cost them uh, four bottles of wine to make that microchip. So they're getting a half a bottle more of wine by specializing microchips and trading rather than just producing that uh, wine, right? And then California, right, would have to give up five bottles of wine to produce a microchip, but they're focusing on wine and trading it. They've only got to give up 4.5 bottles of wine per microchip. So they're actually getting microchips about a half a bottle of wine cheaper. So any uh, uh, exchange ratio of one microchip to anything between four and five bottles of wine is going to make both sides better off, right? But the idea here is, again, California should specialize in what it has the lowest opportunity cost of producing, which is in this case wine. Washington should specialize in what it has the lowest opportunity cost of producing which in this case is microchips. All right, so that's kind of how the law of comparative advantage works uh, from a macroeconomic perspective in terms of maximizing our production by specializing in what we can produce at the lowest opportunity cost. So let's do another example here. So let's talk about trade between, say, two countries now instead of two states, like trade between the United States and China. So on a quiz or exam, I may give you a question like this. Uh, both the United States and China make plastic toys and tires. The United States can make 30 plastic toys or 10 tires in any given day, while China can make 100 plastic toys or 20 tires in a given day. So according to the law of comparative advantage, which of the following are true? Is it A, the U.S. should specialize in producing tires and trade those tires to China who is specializing in uh, plastic toys? Is it B, the U.S. should specialize in producing plastic toys and trade those toys to China who is specializing in tires? Is it C, the United States has a comparative advantage of both goods and so China gains from uh, trade can, uh, so I'm sorry, so no gains from trade can occur? Uh, or is it D, that China has the absolute advantage in both goods 
and so no gains from trade can occur, right? So again, uh, you might want to take a minute to uh, pause the video and see if you can work through this question on your own, right? And then when you're ready, unpause and we'll go through it together. So feel free to pause that video now if you like. But for those of you who want to keep going, let's go ahead and talk about how to work this one out. So again, we've got um, uh, two countries producing two goods. So I'm going to uh, end the full screen here so that we can use our different colors. So again, these two countries are the United States and China. And then our two goods are plastic toys. and tires. All right, so again, it says in the problem that the United States can produce 30 plastic toys or 10 tires, whereas China can produce 100 plastic toys or 20 tires. So right off the bat, you can tell that China has the absolute advantage in both plastic toys and tires. Again, it's a country with a lot more people, so that makes sense. But just because you have the absolute advantage in both things, right, doesn't mean that you have the comparative advantage in both things. In fact, remember, that's impossible. You can't have the comparative advantage in both things. You can only have the comparative advantage in one, right? So with that in mind, it's the law of comparative advantage that we're interested in when it comes to who should specialize in what. In order to figure that out, you need to figure out the opportunity cost for both countries for both goods, right? So again, if the U.S. can produce either 30 plastic toys or 10 tires, then every time they produce a plastic toy, they're giving up one third of a tire. So their opportunity cost of a plastic toy is a third of a tire that they can't make. And then every time they produce a tire, then that is three plastic toys that they can't make, which I'm just going to abbreviate PT here, right? So that's three plastic toys that they can't make for every tire they produce. So that's their opportunity cost of producing tires, right? Now, China, every time that they produce a toy, they give up one-fifth of a tire, again, just dividing 20 by 100, right? So that's one-fifth of a tire as the opportunity cost of producing a plastic toy for them. And then if they decide to produce tires, well, for every tire they produce, then that is five plastic toys that they can no longer produce because they're spending those resources and that time producing those um, tires, right? So with that in mind, if you're looking at who has the comparative advantage in producing plastic toys, you need to figure out who gives up the least every time they produce a toy. So the United States gives up one third of a tire every time they produce a toy. China gives up one fifth of a tire every time they produce a toy. One fifth is a lot less than one third, right? So China has the comparative advantage when it comes to producing those plastic toys. They give up the uh, fewest tires. And when it comes to producing tires, again, you can't have a comparative advantage in both goods, so you should know automatically that the United States has a comparative advantage in producing tires if China has a comparative advantage in producing plastic toys. But we can look at the numbers and uh, confirm that. So again, every time the United States produces a tire, they give up three plastic toys. Every time China produces a tire, they give up five plastic toys. The United States gives up fewer plastic toys for every tire they produce, so they have the comparative advantage in producing tires. So once again, the United States should specialize in tires and um, China should specialize in producing plastic toys. And then they can get together and engage in exchange. And again, looking at these opportunity costs, if they engage in exchange of, say, one tire from the United States in exchange for, say, four plastic toys from China, then again, both sides would be made better off as a result. After all, in order to uh, produce a tire in China, they'd have to give up five plastic toys now they just got to trade four plastic toys to the United States for a tire. So they get that tire one plastic toy cheaper, right? The United States would only get uh, three plastic toys for every tire that they give up. But if they trade that tire to China, then now they get four plastic toys uh, in exchange. So they'd be made better off, right? So again, the exchange ratio that would make both sides better off here would be one tire for four plastic toys. Right. So again, the U.S. should specialize in tires rather than trying to produce both. China should specialize in plastic toys rather than trying to produce both. And they get together and make an exchange of, say, one tire for four plastic toys. Then both sides would be made better off and both countries could produce more in total as a result.
All right, so that's how the law of comparative advantage works. And those are the kinds of problems that I uh, would ask you to do uh, in this macroeconomics class. If you are still a little bit confused about this, have no fear. Uh, week two's discussion session activity is going to be all about this. So watch that video. We're going to go through a few more examples of how to do this because this is the part from chapter two that students tend to have the most trouble with. And after watching those examples, uh, you're going to have an uh, opportunity to do some practice questions as part of uh, your discussion session two assignment. And so you can get plenty more practice with this and hopefully you feel a lot more comfortable with it by the time you actually see it on a quiz or exam. All right, so that's it for the law of comparative advantage. Let's go ahead and move on and talk a little bit about economic organization or begin our discussion of what makes capitalism and socialism different. So first things first, every economy faces three questions that it needs to answer, right? Regardless of what style of economic organization it has, every economy has to answer these three questions. The first question is what will be produced? So what are we going to make as an economy, right? Are we going to make bread, right? If so, how much? Are we going to make 100 loaves of bread, 1,000 loaves of bread? Are we going to make hand sanitizer? If so, how much? Is it going to be 500 bottles? Is it going to be uh, 1,000 bottles? Are we going to uh, produce and operate yoga studios? If so, how many, right? How many hours are we going to uh, be offering yoga services? So what will be produced is the first question that every economy must answer. The second question that every economy must answer is how will it be produced? So once we decide what we're going to make, we need to decide how we're going to make it. Who's going to be in charge of the production process? How are they going to decide um, to produce these particular items? And then once we know what's going to be made and how it's going to be made, we decide who gets the stuff that's going to be made, right? So for whom will it be produced, right? How are we going to decide who gets these particular items? Are we going to allow people to uh, buy these items? So is it going to be based off price and market organization? Or are we going to decide as a group of uh, central planners or a government who gets what, right? So for whom will it be produced? So these are the three questions that every economy must answer. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between uh, socialism and capitalism and how they answer these three questions. All right, so if you grew up in the United States, and you're probably a little bit more familiar with uh, capitalism and how that works, so let's talk about that one first. Uh, capitalism is a system of economic organization where private, uh, productive resources are owned privately, so private individual are the ones who owns the means of production, and they decide based off of those uh, incentives created by their private property rights what to produce and how it's going to be produced. And then as far as who gets what is being made, Right. Well, then those are going to be allocated through what's called market organizations. So our goods and resources are allocated through market organization. And the official definition for that is it's just a method of organization in which private parties make their own plans and decisions with the guidance of market prices. So the hallmark of capitalism is that, again, private individuals are making decisions for themselves about what to produce and how to produce it. And the people who are able and willing to pay for these goods are the ones who are going to get it. The people who are not able and willing to pay for these goods are the ones who might be left out or not be able to get them, right? And so, of course, there are some drawbacks to that system. After all, it might leave some people behind, particularly those who aren't skilled at uh, production or those who have uh, gotten some uh, unfair disadvantages thrown at them throughout their lives, right? And, of course, there could lead to some uh, pretty excessive income inequality in a system like this, right? With that in mind, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about socialism. Socialism is a system of economic organization where ownership and control of the means of production rests with the state. So it's the government that kind of decides what's going to be produced and how it's going to be produced. And as far as who gets what's being made, that is determined by centralized planning or also known as collective decision making. And again, that's kind of where the state is the one making the decisions. So the method of organization that relies on public sector decision making to resolve basic economic questions is what we call that collective decision making. Or again, it's a group of government officials that get together and decide who gets what, right? So with that in mind, let's go ahead and make a, a quick chart here to compare the two, right? So again, we're going to be talking about uh, capitalism versus socialism. So we'll do capitalism there and socialism here. And again, the two ways in which these economic systems are primarily different are who controls the means of production so 
who controls the means of production and um, uh, also how resources are allocated. So resource allocation is the other way in which these two economic systems are very different. So again, to kind of summarize these last two slides and compare them side by side, right? The means of production are owned privately through uh, capitalism. So under capitalism, the answer is who owns the means of production is just private individuals. And then resource allocation is again determined by market prices. So who's willing and able to pay for things? What we call that market organization. Right. Now, when it comes to socialism, again, the means of production are owned by the state or the government. Again, they're the ones making decisions about what to produce and how it's going to be produced. And in terms of resource allocation, that happens through central planning. Again, a group of government officials deciding what everybody should get. All right. And that's it. Those are the two kind of textbook differences between these two economic systems. Of course, you could spend an entire uh, course uh, talking about these differences. In fact, those courses exist. It's called uh, Comparative Economic Systems. But for now, that's kind of what I want you to know. So just know that, again, capitalism is private individuals making decisions about what to make and how it's going to be made. And then, again, these resources are uh, allocated through this market organization of who is willing and able to pay for it. And that's all it is. It isn't necessarily rich people taking advantage of poor people. It isn't necessarily the case of... Um, uh, you know, uh, crony cronyism where the uh, uh, businesses get in bed with the government and exploit the masses or anything like that. All that can happen under capitalism, but all that can kind of happen under socialism as well, right? Under socialism, there actually tends to be as much, if not more, income inequality than under capitalism, and there tends to be at least as much government corruption, right? So again, capitalism is just that private individuals making those decisions with the guidance of market prices. Socialism is the state deciding what gets produced and how it's going to be produced, and again, things are allocated by the state through central planning. And that's all it is, right? It's not a, uh, a uh, Russian conspiracy to take over the world or the Red Menace or anything like that, despite what people have been kind of hearing since the 80s, right? Again, it's just two different ways of organizing economic activity, right? Now, with that in mind, right, I'm going to go ahead and say that most economies, in fact, just about all economies, right, aren't really capitalist or socialist in the pure sense of the words, but it kind of exists along a spectrum, right? Right. So, in other words, uh, you have some uh, countries that are pretty socialist on this end of the spectrum, but not necessarily perfectly socialist. And then you have countries over here that are kind of capitalist on this end of the spectrum, right? And then you've got a whole bunch of countries in between. So, again, there are no countries out there that are purely socialist. I meant to use this color here. So, there are no countries here that are uh, purely socialist. Go ahead and do a better job of doing this here. And there are no countries out there that are purely capitalist, right? But there are a lot of countries there in between, right? So if this were to represent perfect capitalism, there are no countries at the uh, furthest right of the spectrum. If this were to represent perfect socialism, then there are no countries furthest to the uh, left of that uh, spectrum there, right? But again, there are some countries that kind of come close, right? So this might be like your uh, North Korea over here, or maybe your uh, Venezuela right next to them. Right over here, in terms of the most capitalist countries, you have countries like um, uh, Hong Kong or New Zealand, or maybe Singapore at that upper end. You probably got the U.S. Uh, somewhere around here, where it's uh, further cap further towards capitalism than socialism, but not nearly as capitalist as some other countries out there. And then you've got like maybe your Scandinavian countries somewhere in here. So this might be like your Norway or your Sweden. Because again, maybe a little bit more capitalist than socialist, but further towards socialism than, say, the United States is, right? And so that is kind of um, uh, how these uh, uh, how countries are uh, are uh, currently operating along this particular spectrum. And the reason why we know this is because we've actually measured a country's reliance on capitalism versus socialism as a system of economic organization, and we've uh, done that by creating a uh, index here. And that index is called the Economic Freedom of the World Index. So this measures an economy's reliance on capitalism. And it goes on a scale from 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest. So the countries that are closest to a 10 on the scale are the countries that rely most on capitalism. 
based off of things like how strongly held are private property rights, right? How free are they to gauge in uh, free trade? So, you know, are there a lot of trade barriers? If there are, the trade barriers are going to be lower on this index. If there are trade barriers, then they're going to be higher on this index. So again, the countries that are closer to 10 are those more kind of free market capitalist countries. Countries that are closer to the one, uh, one on this index tend to be your less free market or more socialist countries. And when you look at these uh, countries here along this index, the red countries tend to be the most uh, uh, socialist. The blue countries tend to be the most capitalist, right? And then you have these countries in between, right? So it goes from red as the uh, uh, least economically free to kind of this uh, uh, yellow and orange, right? To the green, and then finally the blues as being the most economically free. And so you can take a look at the uh, Economic Freedom of the World Index to kind of see, again, um, how these uh, uh, countries stack up in terms of which ones are more economically free than others. As you can see, these Scandinavian countries, contrary to uh, popular belief, tend to be pretty capitalist, right? They're pretty high on the Economic Freedom of the World Index, right? Um, and again, the countries that are highest on this Economic Freedom of the World Index include uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, and New Zealand. So if you look at the economic, uh, sorry, if you look at the uh, uh, map of a world at night, you'll notice that some countries have a lot more lights and some countries are a lot darker. And this kind of looks at essentially uh, the level of development in those countries, right? So if you go back to the previous slide, I want you to go ahead and look at uh, where the blue countries are and where the red countries are. And then I want you to go ahead and again, looking back here, keeping in mind where the blue countries are and the red countries are, look at the countries that have the most lights. So the blue countries, like the United States or Europe, tend to be the uh, uh, most developed or have the most lights, right? Whereas those countries that are more socialist, like sub-Saharan Africa or most of Russia, right? Those are the ones that tend to be the darkest. There's kind of an exception here with Australia. Australia was uh, is very uh, high on the economic freedom of the world index. But as you notice, all their lights are kind of along the coast. There's not really a lot going on in the interior of Australia. So that's pretty rugged land. I think like nine of the ten deadliest animals of the world all kind of live in there. So again, people tend to stay away from it, right? If you want to kind of break this down further, we can take a look at North Korea versus South Korea, right? In particular, we can take a look at these countries at night. So uh, as you can see, North Korea at night only has one light there in the capital city, whereas South Korea tends to be a lot more lit up. Of course, South Korea is far more economically free, whereas North Korea tends to be far less economically free, right? And so with that in mind, if we look at the per capita income of each country, in North Korea, it's about $1,300 per person, right? Again, that's their uh, per capita income per year, whereas in South Korea, it's about $38,260 per person. So as you can see, South Korea is not only a lot more developed, but people tend to have much higher living standards there. If you want to take a look at Chile versus uh, Venezuela, we can take a look at how their economic freedom has changed over the years. So uh, Chile in 1975, Right, started to adopt a lot of free market measures that increased their economic freedom score pretty uh, 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 drastically to the point where it's uh, getting up close to about an 8 out of 10. Right, Whereas in Venezuela, of course, they started to adopt less free market measures right, as they started that uh, socialist revolution, and that's caused their economic freedom score to plummet. If you take a look at what's happened to their uh, uh, GDP or output per person uh, in response to these changes, again, if you look at Chile from 1975, as their economic freedom has improved, so has their uh, GDP per person. Whereas Venezuela had much higher GDP per person than they do now as a result of that drop in economic freedom, you can see that their uh, uh, output per person has declined drastically as well, right? So there's a very strong correlation between economic freedom and economic production or uh, income per person, or again, that's kind of our general measure for living standards. Those countries that are more economically free tend to have higher living standards. Those countries that are less economically free tend to have lower living standards. And we're going to talk about why here in a few minutes. Right? But before we do, let's go ahead and take a quick tour around the world and look at countries with various levels of economic freedom. Starting at the bottom, so a country with very low economic freedom might be Zimbabwe in Africa. Again, that's kind of in that sub-Saharan Africa region. And if you take a look at their GDP per capita, it's about $1,850 per person, right? So again, per year, that's how much a person could be expecting to make in a real income there. And as you can see, life in Zimbabwe looks pretty rough, right? They don't really have a lot of the goods and services that we tend to have access to on a pretty regular basis, right? Now, if you look at a country with low but slightly higher levels of economic freedom like Tanzania, right? That's another sub-Saharan African country that was socialist for a while, but has recently adopted more and more free market measures 
And so we can take a look at what's happened in those particular countries. So I actually spent a uh, summer in Tanzania back in 2016. And so all these pictures are pictures I took myself as I was doing some of my development projects over there. And their per capita income is about $2,900. So about $1,100 more than it was in Zimbabwe as they've improved their economic freedom. Right. As you can see, they do have vibrant markets in Tanzania. So this is a uh, market that can, people can go to and buy goods and services and what uh, uh, can only be called really free market exchange, right? So people set up these blankets and tents and then they start selling whatever it is that they've been making uh, throughout the weeks or months at these particular markets. To give you an idea of how ingenious or uh, um, uh, the kind of ingenuity that exists among people living in Tanzania, these are sandals that are made out of uh, tire scraps. So if you've ever been driving along the road and you see those kind of scraps of rubber that end up on the side of the road that fall off the tires, right? Well, somebody goes through and collects that in Tanzania, and then they start making these sandals out of it, which are actually pretty durable and uh, uh, are uh, certainly good at protecting your feet as you're walking around, right? So again, it's a pretty ingenious and entrepreneurial idea that somebody there came up with, right? If you go to some of the smaller uh, villages in Tanzania, again, you're going to see um, uh, these kinds of shops with these kinds of prices. To give you an idea, 2,000 Tanzanian shillings is usually equivalent to about one U.S. Uh, dollar there, right? Now, if you go to the bigger cities in uh, Tanzania like Arushu, then you're going to find uh, essentially what are uh, much more developed uh, stores. And this is kind of like uh, the Walmart of Tanzania. It's called Nakumart. And it's not nearly as developed as the Walmart that you might see in the United States, but it's a lot closer than some of the stores that you see in the smaller areas, right? Now, if you go to a country with medium levels of economic freedom, uh, that would include a country like Peru. Actually, I was in Peru in 2015 doing some uh, economic development research at the uh, University of the Amazon in Puerto Maldonado, Peru, which is the Amazonian part of that country. And um, Peru is most known for its to, uh, tourism, things like Machu Picchu and the Incan Trail. But uh, their per capita income there is $12,890. So as you see, higher levels of economic freedom higher per capita income, that's not an unusual result, right? This is the city of Cusco in Peru, which is where you go if you wanted to start hiking the Incan Trail. As you can see, it's a, kind of a, a bit of a shanty town set up where you have a lot of uh, um, kind of uh, low income housing and dwellings, but a pretty bustling city nonetheless with a pretty um, a robust market, right? And again, so the Peruvians are some of the hardest working people I've ever seen. So they're definitely going to get the most out of the opportunities that are given to them. To give you an idea, this is kind of a high elevation city. Uh, when I was over there getting ready to hike the Incan Trail, I did some jogging throughout Cusco to kind of acclimate and prepare myself for it. And again, because I wasn't used to high elevation, I was running pretty slow. I saw this old lady who's maybe about four and a half feet tall with a basket of uh, fabrics that's about as big as she is. And she actually blew right by me. So she ran past me running down to the market to sell those goods in the morning as I was jogging along, not carrying anything, right? So again, this old lady who's about uh, half my size ended up running about twice as fast while carrying a big basket of fabrics, right? That's how important it was for her to get down there and start uh, buying and selling goods, right? Um, this, uh, as you get to more developed cities in Peru, like uh, Arequipa, you're going to see, again, much more development, right? Uh, you're going to see uh, a town square with a nice, beautiful fountain and some of the fattest pigeons I've ever seen in my life, right? Pigeons that fat can only exist in countries that are starting to do well. Right. Uh, as people uh, start feeding them any extra food that they might have. Right. Um, and then if you go to a city like Lima, Peru, right, you're going to see even more development. You're going to see the kinds of skyscrapers and buildings that you're traditionally used to seeing over here in the uh, United States. By the way, if you're interested, that is my father who actually helped me make the trip down there. as that bullfighter I was telling you about back in chapter one. All right. So he came on me with this trip just because he loves South America. Uh, you know, having me able to speak Spanish, he helped me get around a little bit while I was down there. Uh, then if you go to countries with fairly high levels of economic freedom, like Romania, you're going to see even more development. So these are countries that are kind of in that green range. And um, I didn't, haven't been to Romania personally, but I like using them as an example because they have some of the best pictures. So in Romania, the per capita income is about $25,150, or about twice of what it is in Peru. Uh, again, if you still go to the rural parts, as in uh, uh, most countries, the rural parts are a bit poor, right? You're going to see some pretty rough dwellings. However, you will see things like satellite dishes on some of those rough dwellings, right? You might see people using cars, but again, those cars are being pulled by horses rather than an actual engine. Again, this is what you might see in the rural or poorer parts of the country, right? 
Now, as you get to, um, again, more advanced parts of the country, you're going to see people using motorized vehicles. And again, they're going to use those vehicles and get the most out of them in ways that you maybe never thought uh, possible. Right? Again, you can see them working pretty hard getting a lot of this uh, uh, material or hay here on this particular vehicle. This is probably my favorite picture. Right? So if you look at this vehicle, you're going to see at least uh, not one, two, but three cows in the back of this sedan. Right, so if you're ever wondering or questioning the ingenuity or work ethic of people in uh, Romania, just remember this picture of seeing three cows in the back of a sedan. I don't know how you get one, let alone three cows in the back of a car, but this person managed to do it. So again, use that car to trans uh, transport that uh, livestock. Right? They do have uh, McDonald's in Peru, how you go up to the drive through or sorry, in uh, Romania, but how you go up to that drive through might be uh, slightly different. And then, of course, if you go to the big cities in Romania, you're going to see the kinds of development that you're used to seeing here in the United States. Right. So uh, we're probably going to end here with a country with very high levels of economic freedom, like Hong Kong, uh, which is located in Asia, kind of off of China. So if you're looking at uh, life in Hong Kong, again, in the rural parts, you're still going to see uh, some shabby dwellings, but much better than you're going to see in the rural parts of these countries with lower levels of economic freedom. And then you're going to see a lot more development and access to a lot better technology in these areas that are more developed. Again, the per capita income in Hong Kong is about $64,100, which is uh, more than twice of what it was in Romania. Right? So again, if you're looking at these schools uh, in Hong Kong, you're going to see schools similar to those that you might see in the United States or other developed countries. If you go to the uh, uh, more affluent parts of the country, again, you'll see a bunch of skyscrapers and buildings that are similar to what you might see in the United States. So again, where you have more economic freedom, you tend to have more development and higher living standards, right? So I have a quick video here on economic freedom. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, watch this video clip and talk about what economic freedom is and how it's important to living standards. So let's go ahead and take a second to watch this video and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Imagine you would have to live in a country from one of these two lists for the rest of your life. Which list would you choose? If you're like most people, you would choose A. Let's take a look at why that is. Take Chile and Venezuela. Chile's poverty rate is half that of Venezuela's, and its inflation rate is a fraction of the size. Actually, all of list A appears to be better off than B. Look at income per person. It's 10 times higher on average in list A. But these lists aren't organized by income. They're organized by economic freedom. List A countries have the most free economies in the world. List B, the least free. Across the globe, we see a strong relationship between economic freedom and people's quality of life. For instance, people in the most free countries earn, on average, over eight times more than people in the least free. The poor earn ten times more. People in the most free countries are happier. They have better protected civil rights, cleaner environments, and the average person lives 20 years longer. The freest countries also have less corruption, less infant mortality, less child labor, and less unemployment. So if you care about improving people's lives, then you really care about economic freedom. And having economic freedom means your property is protected under an impartial rule of law. You're free to trade with others for what you need and want. Your money keeps its value because your national currency is stable. And government stays small relative to the size of the economy. All right, so that's the end of that clip. As you can see, there's the kinds of things that make up economic freedom. Again, it's actually a lot of data that gets compiled across uh, um, seven different indexes that they then use to come up with the score uh, that ends up being uh, between one and 10, 10 being the most free and one being the least free. Again, countries that are higher in the economic freedom index tend to do uh, better economically in terms of having those higher living standards and uh, doing better on those other measures talked about in that video, the countries that are lower on that economic freedom index, at least in general, right? So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about economic uh, organization in terms of why this economic freedom stuff tends to work whereas uh, less economic freedom is not quite as beneficial when it comes to economic production. 
So why is it that capitalism tends to work and socialism doesn't work so well? And again, this is stuff that's kind of been studied throughout history and the world over. And again, before we actually go through this, I want to preface this again by saying that there is no uh, system that relies uh, – on perfect capitalism. In other words, it's just individuals making decisions. There's no government involvement at all when it comes to decision making. Just like there is no system that relies on perfect socialism where it's completely run by the state and there's no private uh, economic organization happening at all, right? So again, we're talking about uh, uh, capitalism working better than socialism. I'm not talking about pure capitalism as necessarily being the best or pure socialism as necessarily being the worst because we don't know what those systems would do or what those systems might look like. What we do know is that countries that are further towards that capitalism uh, scale or higher on that capitalism scale tend to uh, do better economically. So let's talk a little bit about why. Right. One is that, again, capitalism is similar to this idea of natural selection. Again, individuals are making decisions with regards to their private property rights. If they can make those decisions efficiently, like through the nature of competition, if they're doing a good job of keeping their uh, costs down and their prices low and their customers happy – and those are businesses that are going to go on and survive or reproduce and people are going to copy their ways of doing things, right? Those businesses that aren't able to keep their uh, uh, prices low or their customers happy or those businesses that aren't operating inefficiently, those are the ones that are most likely to go out of business and then free up those productive resources for those um, uh, more efficient companies, right? So again, it's making sure that the resources are being used by the uh, companies who can use them the best. Whereas under socialism, Right? There's less competition because the government kind of decides what's being made and who gets everything. And as a result of that, because there's not that competitive uh, fire that encourages people to produce more efficiently, things tend to happen at a much uh, less efficient rate. And then another thing that happens, and probably the biggest reason why socialism tends to uh, not be as effective a system of economic organization when it comes to producing things like income per capita, is that socialism suffers from an information problem. And what we mean by that is that under capitalism – you just have to know yourself. You have to know what you prefer, right? what you're best at producing, what you uh, uh, want to buy at this moment in time. Whereas under socialism, it requires a group of central planners to know everybody else's preferences. right? So I know exactly when I want to buy, say, a loaf of bread or a uh, stick of butter. I know ex exactly how I might want to run my business. Whereas under socialism, it requires the government to know exactly when you might want to buy a loaf of bread or a stick of butter and exactly how they uh, should run your particular business. And because it's a lot harder to know somebody else's preferences than it is for you to know your own preferences, it's a lot harder for, say, a group of central planners to make decisions for a large group of people than it is for those people to make decisions for themselves. Right? So that's kind of the main reason why socialism tends to suffer or fall under the weight of its own inefficiency is because they don't have – as the central planners don't have all the up-to-date information about people's changing preferences. You know when your own preferences change. You don't necessarily know when somebody else's preferences change. And if we're talking about 300 million people across a, uh, a large country, again, it's going to be even harder to figure out uh, what those people's preferences are. Having said that, right, again, if you are a fan of socialism, I'm not going to necessarily say that you're wrong. There are some uh, good parts about it or some trade-offs that you might feel are worth it. Uh, basically, you want to ask yourself this. If you were going to start a business and, say, maybe open up a yoga studio or whatever, decide how you want that yoga studio run. Do you want to decide how you want that yoga studio run? Do you want to decide uh, kind of what hours it's going to be open, how much you're going to charge, what you're going to do with those profits? If that's the case, then you might be more for capitalism. If you think it might be better for a group of government officials to decide how that yoga studio is going to be run, in other words, they get to decide how many hours it's going to be open, how much you're going to charge, and what to do with your profits, you might be for socialism. Now, if you're like most people, you think that you might need a little bit of a balance between the two. Like you might want to decide how that yoga studio is run in terms of the hours it's open, prices you're charging, at least what to do with some of your profits. But you might also think the government should get to decide what to do with some of your profits, maybe not all of them but at least some of them. And also the government might uh, get to put in certain regulations about how you're allowed to operate for the safety of the customers. That's more of, again, uh, kind of combining some socialism with capitalism in that mixed system, which is kind of what most countries do. Uh, again, it's that you're not purely socialist or capitalist. You're somewhere on that spectrum. And again, where you are on that spectrum might determine what kind of uh, living standards the people in your country can expect to see. Right. But again, that's kind of what I want you to know for now. Um, from about capitalism versus socialism and how that works. Right. And so that is it for this chapter. 
make sure you understand how voluntary trade creates value and how individuals become wealthy through that process of voluntary exchange that leads to economic growth. Uh, growth. Uh, remember that uh, when somebody becomes uh, wealthy through voluntary exchange, they don't make everybody else poor. They make everybody else richer by providing goods and services that they are willing to pay for. Uh, know the four incentives of private property rights that we talked about. Where it gives you incentive to use your resources in ways that other people value. It gives you an incentive to care for and manage what you own. It gives you an incentive to conserve for the future or avoid those tragedy the commons type issues. And it gives you an incentive to make sure that your property doesn't damage somebody else's property. Be able to identify the points on the production possibilities curve. Tell me which points are efficient. Those are the points on the curve. Which points are inefficient. Those are the points inside the curve. And then which points are unattainable. Those are the points outside the curve. Again, be able to tell me what's produced at a certain point and then what's given up and gained when you go from one point to another. Know the four factors that shift that production possibilities curve. Remember, it could be a change in resources, a change in technology, a change in the rules or laws under which an economy functions, or working harder versus working less are all things that could shift that curve outward or inward. Understand the law of comparative advantage as it relates to opportunity costs and trade between nations. Remember that it is the uh, person... Uh, group of individuals or nation who produces things at the lowest opportunity cost who has the uh, comparative advantage and they should specialize in the production of that which they do have the comparative advantage and then trade for everything else. Those are the three questions that every economy must uh, answer, right? What's going to be produced? How are we going to produce it? And then who gets it once it's made? And then finally, know the difference between capitalism and socialism and how they answer those questions and know why capitalism tends to work better in most economies, or at least a larger reliance on capitalism tends to work better on most economies, uh, even if we don't know exactly how pure capitalism would work. Right. All right, so that is it for Chapter 2, and that's it for Module 2. Right. Make sure that you complete your discussion session assignment as well as your module quiz, and I will see you all next week for Chapter 3 and Module 3. That's on supply and demand. That's a pretty graph-heavy chapter, so I'm fairly excited to talk about it. And I hope you are too. Uh, if you have any questions between now and then, please feel free to email me or, again, come to Zoom office hours. But uh, until then, uh, take care, have a good one, and let me know if you need anything.